Laura, we have you for public comment, and I know that you're going to do the presentation on um, the which housing project again? Oh, that's so many. This is uh, 23 Laurel Street. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> so that so that's why you're here. Yes. Excellent. Yeah, I can hear you now. You were just all right. So I just wanted to make sure that was why you were here. Um so yes, so um public comment, Keith. I know you have something to say, and so it looks like there's nobody else here, so go ahead. Hey, yeah, I was gonna ask this a uh, written letter. Um do you wanna wait till we go through our thing and maybe the person will show up? Uh, but if not, then Laura doesn't have to sit through me reading this letter. Um, is that okay? Or Sure. So in other words, somebody can... might come public comment, but in their stead, you have a letter and maybe we can delay that a little bit to see if they show up. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, we can do that. All right, so let's go on to um, the minutes from last month. Does anybody have a motion to approve or have any major corrections? Major, or I should say the other way, major corrections or motion to approve? I'll move to approve. Anybody second? I'll second it. Okay, does anybody object? Anybody in the housing partnership? Okay, so moved. All abstain. I wasn't there. Okay, Richard. Yes, we missed you. I'm glad you're here tonight. Um, so that does rather quickly, Laura, bring us to you and your presentation and um, our, our comments and questions following that. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> Keith, can I share screen? You'd be all set. All right. Are we seeing this? Yes. Awesome. Very so clearly. If you don't mind, I'm going to start us off with a little PowerPoint just to get us warmed up. Um, and then if I run through this, maybe we can take questions at the end because it, it may be that I address your so questions I, as I, I go through. I um, just sat and being delayed. Uh, other people having that problem? I can see the PowerPoint fine. Okay. Yeah, I'm having a delay hearing Carmen. Is that what you're hearing, Carmen? Are you guys hearing me now? No? Yeah. We can hear you, Carmen. Okay, good. Laura, go ahead. <laughs> well, thankfully, I have this visual aid, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> um, so before I, I launch, I just wanted to mention that this is a little bit of an unusual sequence for us. Uh, typically, we are seeking local funds, including uh, CPA, Community Preservation Act funds, really early in the planning stages of our developments. Um, and in this case at 23 Laurel Street, we're kind of on our head because this is a fully funded project, uh, fully funded by the state, ready to go, hopefully under construction in the spring um, with a financing gap. And so that is what is causing us to go back to, you know, come late in the sequence to the CPA and the financing gap is caused by the cuckoo bananas state of our construction costs these days. So, um, here we go. So this site is located at 23 Laurel Street. Uh, this is a visual aerial view showing you where the location is. So uh, Laurel Street is here, Chapel Street is here, L3, formerly Cole Morgan is here, Grove Street and the Grove Street Inn are down here. Uh, we are close to a bus stop, uh, just up and around the corner, right in front of Village Hill is the closest bus stop that goes along uh, this R44 line that goes along Chapel Street. There's another bus line that goes along Route 5 and 10 down here. Uh, we are very close to the uh, rail trail, you just kind of go down this way, down Grove Street, and you can hop on the rail trail. It's about a one mile walk into the center of town. Uh, it's a 1.68 acre vacant parcel. 
It was formerly part of the Northampton State Hospital grounds, and it is currently owned by the city uh, and restricted for use for affordable housing. And Valley holds an option to purchase it for one dollar. We do plan to uh, make that acquisition within about two weeks time. Uh, it's within a sustainable growth overlay district, also known as 40R. Uh, what we're proposing is new construction of 20 townhouse style apartments that are grouped within seven buildings. So there are two to four apartments within each of these buildings. And I'll show you some renderings in a minute. Uh, it's 100% affordable housing. Uh, the current status, uh, as we talked about, we, we're basically pretty far along. We have a zoning permit. We have all of our other funds uh, awarded. They were awarded earlier this year. We're planning to acquire the site very soon. And we're currently seeking 420,000 in CPA funds to defray construction cost escalation. Uh, we are currently out to bid for a general contractor. We hope to start to build in April uh, and finish building the following year and lease up apartments by the end of 2025. Uh, the composition of this development includes eight one bedrooms, 10 two bedrooms, and two three bedroom apartments, a total of 34 bedrooms. And the income limitations, restrictions for tenants, we have 12 households that will be earning 30% of the area median income or less, also known as extremely low income, and eight households who will need to earn 60% of the area median income or less. The 30% AMI units will be paired with project-based vouchers. So those households will pay approximately 30% of their gross income for rent. The eight households at 60% AMI will pay a fixed below market rent. Um, we have a strong focus uh, in this development on vulnerable populations. Uh, specifically, we'll have four apartments that have a preference for homeless households. We'll have three apartments that have a closed referral from the Department of Mental Health for uh, th their clients. We'll have two apartments that will have a closed referral from Safe Passage for uh, survivors of domestic violence mm -hmm. and three fully handicapped accessible apartments with a priority for tenants who need mobility accommodations. So you're just seeing here the, the types of priority um, priorities, the number of apartments for each priority and then the different apartment sizes that are dedicated to those, those priorities. Um, we will have supportive services as part of this development. Uh, providers include the Department of Mental Health, Safe Passages. We will have a part-time resident services coordinator who will be a circuit writing uh, uh, coordinator serving multiple Valley properties in Northampton. And that person will provide linkages to other community-based uh, service providers. Ooh, there's a lot written on this page. Uh, some <laughs> of the design features, uh, we chose to do these kind of smaller townhouse groupings really to kind of fit the scale and massing of the neighborhood, which is primarily either single family or small multifamily buildings. Uh, no two buildings are identical, so that we give it a little bit of variety. The city required that we would have 100% electric utilities, no fossil fuels. And we're using uh, PV solar as much as we can on this site. Uh, almost all the apartments have universal access. So if you have a visitor in a wheelchair, they can get to your apartment. Uh, all the walkways and outdoor common areas are handicapped accessible. And then we have walkways within the property connecting to the public sidewalks. We're including amenities like covered bike storage, a playground and a pavilion. Um, and we're reducing pavement uh, through use of a one-way driveway. Yeah. This is a rendering of the site plan. Uh, again, this, this site is kind of a long and somewhat narrow site. This is Laurel Street down here. Um, you do see this one-way drive that will come in and loop around. There are 20 parking spaces being provided on site. Normal things like dumpsters, little play area here, a little pavilion for outdoor gathering here, uh, bike rack here, mailboxes over here. Um, and then you see the different groupings that we have of these kind of townhouse style apartments, uh, some fencing, some landscaping. Um, on the right hand side of the site, you see a lot of open green space, which will primarily serve as stormwater management, although the upper green space will be a level lawn area with some sub subsurface infiltr infiltration. So a nice, though small, compact 
little playing yard there. Uh, this is a little bit of a perspective view of the different buildings. These are also some samples of kind of what the buildings will look like. They're pretty classic New Englandy style, gable roof, um, kind of nicely articulated buildings. Um, the floor plan for these buildings, I, I've got to say, it's probably my favorite floor plan that, that we've worked with. Um, basically, the floor plan was designed almost like a jigsaw puzzle piece that we could flip around and, and combine to make different size units. So all of the ground floor units, which is 17 out of, out of the 20, will have a private patio uh, by the main entry. So you would come in this private patio area and it's directly connected to your main living space. Um, with a one bedroom unit, you would have one side of the one wing is kind of your living area, kitchen, dining. The other wing is your bedroom and then a good sized bathroom with a washer and dryer. Uh, if you're in a, mul a, a multi-bedroom unit, then you would have essentially a layout on the first floor with the kitchen and dining on one side, the living area on the other side, and then you would go upstairs to access your bedrooms and a full bathroom. Uh, nice little kind of alcove study space here. Again, washer dryers in each of these units looking at some PV panels. Um, and then these are just a couple of renderings. We're not, we're not promising this color, but we're trying to give people a sense of what these would look like uh, when they were built. So there's probably the one that looks closest to what it might look like when it's constructed. Um, in terms of financing, this is an just under $13 million um, development. We are maximizing the use of non-local sources. And this is a list of these various other sources that are coming in. Uh, a grant from the Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston, a big chunk from tax credit equity, another fairly sizable chunk from state ARPA funds, and then another chunk from state, what we call soft debt. Um, and we've pretty much maxed out all of these different programmatic sources. What the city has done to assist to date uh, with this development is donating the land, um, which was donated in turn to the city from the state and is restricted for affordable housing use, uh, providing a 40R overlay zone so that we could have greater density by right, um, and doing some infrastructure improvements along Laurel Street um, that were primarily paid for by a housing choice grant to the city. So the city has not yet put directly any of its local money, such as CDBG or CPA into this particular development. Uh, so we do have this $420,000 pending. Um, that $420,000 is 3.2% of the total development cost. And it also translates to uh, $21,000 per unit of support from the city. Yeah. I'm going to come back, see if we have questions. All right. First of all, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I have gone. a question, but before yeah. we go on to my question, do other people here have questions? I, I, I see we have some added participants. Carol Leeper, you're here from the Northampton Housing Authority. And Jack Redman. I'm not sure if people are here to hear Laura's presentation also, but um, this is the time to speak up. So let me know, raise your hand or say something regarding the Laurel Street uh, presentation. Uh, this okay. is Okay, seems Spencer. like it was extremely- So we got a couple hands up. So far that I can see. My question, just remind me, is how many units? 34 20. units? 20 units. Oh, okay. 20 units. Okay. Um, can somebody help me out whose hand is up? Spencer had his, you were asking a question. So I saw you go up before me. Why don't you go first? Oh, sure. Spencer, uh, I think my question's probably, I don't know if it's, well, I'll just ask it. And you can tell me if it's appropriate timing for it. But and there's probably little to do about it, but in terms of the 100% electric utilities, mm -hmm. is there going to be, I know that electric heating costs can be substantial. Yep. Um, is there, 
and I forgive me for jumping in late, there's a new committee member and yes. obviously the city mandated 100% electric utilities. Yes, sir. But is there any way or any programs to offset those heating yeah. costs that would yeah. be available? So um, this is not your old school uh, baseboard resistance electric heat. Um, these are air sourced heat pumps. So they are more efficient than old style. However, electricity is still very expensive. Um, with these units, people will pay a fixed rent and it will include all of their utilities. So that includes heat, um, air conditioning, hot water, plug-in electric. So anything that has to do with electricity, sadly, we are gonna pay the bear the brunt of that. We will also though be defraying that with the, the PV solar. Um, there are a lot of incentives at the front end, uh, Spencer, to help with the cost of developing all electric, um, but there are not at this point operating subsidies that I'm aware of, um, but the, the burden of that will not fall on the tenants. Thank you. Yep, and then I saw Bev and Gordon. Yep. Go ahead, Bev, and then Gordon. Uh, hi, yeah, that was a great presentation. Um, Thank you. I had questions and then you answered them. But what I couldn't do was add up all your sources of funds to <laughs> figure out what the total equaled, but more yes. importantly, what approximately is the per unit cost? Yeah. It's too horrifying for me to put the time. I know, it's probably, um, yeah. it's kept secret. So no, it's not secret, but it is, it is shocking how expensive um, yeah. construction has become. So the total development cost I mentioned is just under 13 million, which is putting these at a per unit cost of around $550,000. Um, I'm, I'm not shocked at that, but if I could ask a follow-up. Yeah. Um, so uh, what, bidding contingency, if any, is built into your current numbers since you're just going out to bid? Right. So as Bev knows and other people may recognize, the time when we plan and ask for money versus the time when we go under construction, there can be a difference of like a year and a half. And usually we can kind of deal with the escalation that happens during that course of time, but right now we can't. So we had... Um, priced it originally at $400 a square foot to build, which seemed shockingly high, um, but it's gone past that. And so now we're looking at about $460 a square foot for construction costs. And so that is the gap that is causing us to ask for this CPA money. Um, that gap is being made up. The gap itself is over $1.2 million. Most of it's gonna come from the 4% tax credit program but not all of it can. And so that's the, the missing piece that we're asking for um, from the city. Thank you. Sure. Um, Gordon? Yeah, so I'm interested in just hearing a little bit more about how you came to determine the preferences that you selected. And was this something which you had prearranged with, I mean, you've got two specific community yeah. providers. Right, right. So we had been approached um, several years ago by Safe Passages um, about trying to develop some affordable housing for their clients specifically. Um, they were finding that people were getting into their shelter, which of course now is closed, um, but at that time getting into their shelter and just not able to move on because there wasn't affordable housing for them to move into. And so we said, we like what you do. They said, we like what you do. So we did a... a um, an MOU, a, an agreement that if we built it, they would provide services. So that's how the two units of family um, DV, domestic violence housing came to be. It's our first time having that set aside. It's a bit of an experiment, but we think it's a really great um, partnership and it's a, definitely, we know there's a need. Um, because this parcel was part of the Northampton State Hospital property, um, the Department of Mel Mental Health has um, a requirement that we provide, I think it's 15% of housing developed for their clients. So that's where we got to those three uh, Department of Mental Health uh, apartments. We typically include a handful anyway in the work that we do because we have a strong working relationship with, with DMH, um, but that 
drove this, the location being part of the state hospital drove that particular preference. Um, the homeless preference is a mandate. Um, it's a requirement for funding from the state. At this point, you have to have a certain percentage of units for homeless families or individuals. Um, the need there is quite desperate. Um, so we're, we're happy to have that included as well. Um, and then wheelchair accessibility, again, is something we try to put into every development that we do. Yeah, so will the preferences, I mean, this may be more of a leasing issue down the road, but once the units are filled and this turnover, will those preferences remain then? Yes. They continue on in perpetuity? Yes. yes, they'll continue in perpetuity um, and the, the support to subsidize those rents will be project-based vouchers that will remain with those particular physical units. So as families or individuals come and go, that rental subsidy is designed to stay in place. Okay. One more question. When yeah. you put those non-local sources of funding, you did it quickly. Can you can maybe just answer this? Is that carrying? Does that mean that's all debt? Was that debt that it looked like? None of it. <laughs> <Just carrying. laughs> it seems like a lot. It is a lot. So um, the the tax credits come in as equity to the project. So that is that is the deal with both with the federal and the state tax credit programs. Is that private investors? give us essentially equity in exchange for tax credits over 10 years that the federal or state government gives to them. So that's equity. We're required to keep the units affordable and follow rules. Um, the soft debt and the ARPA debt coming from the state will come, when I say soft debt, it means it comes with a mortgage, but we don't repay it unless we're out of compliance with our affordable housing restriction. Cool. So there is no permanent debt, meaning debt that we repay every month on this development, partly because of its size at 20 apartments, it's small, and partly because some of the things we've been talking about, that we want to put money into service delivery, that we have to pay for all electric utilities, that we want to absorb the cost of utilities for tenants. So all those things being that at the bottom, you know, we kind of break even, hopefully, okay. um, but we don't have money left over cash flow to pay debt. Okay, are there other hands raised? Not so far, right? I'm not missing anybody. So, no. so Laura, Laura uh, just the essential your... question you're asking, aside from your presentation, is would we would we would we write a letter of approval for this project to the CPA for this round of funding? So let me just bop over. I don't know if Keith had something he wanted to say. We got a little overlapping there. Oh, no, I think uh, I think okay. uh, Carmen's on it. Okay. So yes, I'm here to ask very pretty please with the partnership, right? Um, it's not so much approval, it's support. A letter of support that says, you know, we think this is a good project. We hope you fund it. Yeah. Yes, yes, that was poorly worded. All right, so <laughs> can we have a motion to write, uh, do we need a motion to write a letter of support? I can't mm -hmm. remember how this, is, even though we do it all the time. So can I have a motion to write a letter of support for this portion of funding for Laurel Street? So moved. And second? I'll second, second that. <laughs> okay, so- It's all yours. <laughs> okay, so let's make sure though. Let's vote. Gordon? Yes. Uh, Spencer? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Bev? Yes. Edgar? Yes. Hannah? Yes. Richard? Yes. Uh, and then I am a yes, and I think I have everybody on the partnership. Okay, so move. we will write a letter of support, and that will go in by the end of the week. Sounds so good. much. And I believe we'll be going for a public hearing before the CPA. I think it's November 1st, but I can keep you apprised. It's always awesome if uh, partnership members want to join to say something or write a quick email to say a personal thing about how important affordable housing is or why it's an important project or anything like that. Um, Usually different applicants come into the CPA with constituents that advocate for their projects. So we'll be looking for those as well. Um, thank you so much. 
Thank you, Laura. As always, thank you for being here. Thank you for your sure. presentation and presence. <clears throat> All right, so let's go back to public comment. Kara, I know you're here for that. I wanna welcome you. Um, can you please, um, I think we all know who you are, but obviously please introduce yourself and um, and um, let us know um, what's up. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Kara Leeper. I'm the Executive Director of the Northampton Housing Authority. Um, and I had asked um, Keith for um, the draft minutes of your last meeting. Um, and I wanted to come on and clarify something that I read in your last meeting minutes. Um, may I do so? Of course, please. Um, I'd like to clarify what I read in the draft minutes. Your last meeting where Bev, uh, when asked by Bev Bates, um, what are some of the issues that are so contentious? And Edgardo Kensell's response, it's mostly the service that is being offered to tenants and management taking a defensive side. We don't believe that this is accurately represents the entire situation. Contentious issues in any agency can encompass a wide range of concerns, including but not limited to rent disputes, maintenance problems, and communication challenges. It's important to consider a broader perspective before drawing conclusions based on one individual's statements. Certainly, it's worth noting that challenge may also arise from newer members who are still in the process of understanding their roles and how they interact with the executive sector or team as a whole. This learning curve can sometimes contribute to misunderstandings and contentious situations within any organization. It's important to foster open communication and provide support for all members to navigate their roles effectively. Moreover, it's essential to acknowledge that at our July, as our July minutes reflect in Commissioner Richard's statement, quote, I contacted you regarding a request that you report on NHA board meetings of issues and projects that are happening at the partnership level. You stated that you did not want to do so, and I cannot remember talking you talking at any meetings at our partnership and how better we could work together, end quote. This refusal to do so has added to the contentious atmosphere Transparency and regular reporting can help address concerns and building uh, trust among members. And it's unfortunate when such requests are declined, further complicating the situation. I would be more than happy to discuss all the wonderful things that we have done and are doing with uh, and for our residents in addition to the community of Northampton at any future meeting that you'd like to have me at. Um, what I would like to do is, um, offer to attend your meetings so that in the future, if there's any questions um, that you may have about what's going on here at the Housing Authority, um, I'm happy to do so. Uh, today, I had three meetings that I have to attend, uh, but I did wanna come in and make uh, it so that the public record reflects um, that statement. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for our meeting. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, we are when we have public comment in this meeting, we um, if we have time, we do allow for some conversation. Would you have a few minutes to see if anybody would like to say a word? Sure. I don't have um, uh, our board meeting isn't until 630. So I'm happy to stay on um, until a couple of minutes before that. If you have any questions. Sure. Okay. So does anybody have any questions for Kara? I want to I have something I think I'm not I'm not forgetting anybody here. Um so I just wanted to clarify one part of what you said which I think and I'm not totally sure um was that when you read the minutes of our last housing partnership meeting you noticed that there had been an exchange in which um, some sort of maybe one-sided allegations were made. Let me just put it like that. And what you're saying today is that conversations and you're offering a conversation for a fuller understanding and um, so that all, every, 
everybody can be heard towards a non-contentious fuller understanding. Am I am I getting that right? Um, yeah, I think that, you know, our, our former chair had asked the Housing Partnerships appointee to uh, do a monthly report um, to uh, the Northampton Housing Authority Board of Commissioners, um, and that didn't happen. And, um, you know, I didn't realize that we were a topic of discussion. And so, um, I, you know, I guess I have to make it my... Um, I have to make it a priority to attend meetings so that if there's any questions or clarification necessary, that I can do so. Um, um, I did meet with Mr. Benoit um, and you know provided some minutes to him. Um, I think that um, you know we're we're in the process of doing some training with our with our commissioners, um, and so I'm hoping that that's helpful for us to have a resolution. Um, but I'm certain that some of you have watched our meetings and they've become quite uh, quite Jerry Springer-like, if I can just be frank about it. Uh, and so uh, I'm hoping that my attendance at some of the other meetings that aren't, aren't ours um, will uh, resolve that nonsense. Thank you. Are there other comments that people want to make now. Okay, so I want to close out this part of public comment. Kara, thank you very much for coming. Thank you are reminding all of us that um, we live in a, in a moment of contention and that we all need to listen and um, just take each other into account. That's what I say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Of course, you're welcome to stay, but I know you. I, I know you have a lot of things to do. Thank you. I do. I have a meeting at six thirty, but I'll stay for a little bit. Okay. Very good. Um. So the next item on the agenda is the follow up discussion regarding the municipal housing, affordable housing trust fund. Um. I'd like to say a few words about that and then I'll open it up for discussion. So I was at the September 21st training, uh, not all of it, but um, I would say the first half. Um, I was especially interested in the first half because um, Shelly, I uh, can't remember what her last name is, um, from Southampton um, was talking about how Southampton developed a municipal housing affording trust fund from from scratch. We have one that's sort of in the wings. Um, we have been laboring over this on and off for a couple of years. We feel like it's necessary, but the city has not been enthusiastic. Um, uh, Let me say as an aside that I just heard from Alexis, I can't remember her last name, but she's the CEO of Valley CDC. Um, Keith, can you help me, Breit, Breit Binder? Alexis? Right necker. <laughs> right necker. That, um, you still hear Laura, that, um, that the Northampton Nursing Home uh, Rehab has not been able to go on because, because uh, Valley CDC was denied state funding in the last round. So it is sitting vacant um, and not being worked upon because that denial um, took place last March after Valley CDC applied last fall. Um, and I bring that up because here's a good example of how nimbleness and more funding would help our, our um, development agencies. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, Shelley talked about the importance of getting buy-in from city councilors or whatever kind of city government you have, in our case, city council and the mayor, um, local developers. Um, I, I have a few other things to say, but I, I wanna stop there, Keith. I know you were also at that meeting and I wondered if you had anything to add and anybody else, and then I'd like to just further that discussion. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, I didn't know what to expect from the training, and um, the uh, the training was basically, you know, if you're going forward with a, a trust fund, um, and they did discuss maybe different ways to analyze, kind of. Um, so I was looking for more kind of analysis and, you know, how does that balance with other funds and things like that? Um, but uh, yeah, so I thought the second and third ones were a little better, um, but uh, that training is available, the slides, the video, um, just three sessions, one hour each. Um, and the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Fund guide, the MA MHP, has they did an update on it and that is available on the MHP website and I can uh, send that out. Okay, so I'm just gonna say a couple more words here. Um, this made me really wonder once again, why I feel, and if you, you if anybody doesn't agree with me, let me know like we're working in a silo. There's the planning department. Here's the housing partnership. Over here's the mayor. Over here is the city council. We have to have buy-in. You know, we've been sort of laboring over this. We want to revive the, the affordable housing trust fund um, and looking at ways to do it and taking trainings and a subcommittee to research that. We have to have buy-in from the city of Northampton, the mayor and the city council, um, among others. Um, before we actually could go further. And part of it is not actually, would not be our responsibility to go further, but it would need to be broadened. And I wondered then with this news I heard from Alexis from Valley CDC, Northampton nursing home reconstruction is at a standstill because they were denied state funding. Wouldn't, isn't that a perfect example of how a municipal housing trust fund might come in in a more nimble way to help fill a gap. Um, it made me wonder again about having communication with counselors, the mayor, et cetera, in order to see if our uh, uh, renewed knowledge of this could stimulate some interest or if we're really barking up the wrong tree. Tell me if you're raising your hand, Hannah. Uh, I was just thinking, Carmen, when you were talking, um, you know, I'm wondering if at this point at all, it's it's not so much an issue of not having buy-in from the city as much as like, I mean, it seems like it there's a significant amount of work that will be involved and the path has been unclear. And I'm kind of wondering if it's the kind of thing now where if we just keep the subcommittee active and we keep on the path of restarting the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, if as long as we do the hard work behind it, if, if the buy-in actually is there. Um, I put that out as a question to other people because I'm, I'm genuinely curious. I mean, I'm curious if this is just an issue of like, there's nobody else at the city level who's like, has the time to do this work. But if we did a lot of the foundational stuff, it would be supported, uh, especially seeing the nursing home project at a standstill right now, which is a good example. Good question. Uh, uh, I would like to speak to that. Let me, I have to mute. Yeah. Here. My experience with city government over, unfortunately, quite a long time is that it's not barking up the wrong tree. It's running our heads into a stone wall. And there was an initial sense from the planning department that this was not something that they wanted to have on their plate. Uh, and I think that message uh, percolated through the previous administration. And I think that the city councilors, this is not an issue where they will take the lead. Uh, and that if we really want this to happen, we have to get buy-in from the planning department and the mayor. And without that, it's going to be 
pretty impossible. And even if we were willing to do everything, we will still be getting the argument that we don't have the staff capacity to do it and it's too expensive and it's redundant. I agree, as I've stated many times about the desirability and the necessity of this, but uh, if we wanna be pragmatic, I think that's the route to take. Thank you, Richard. Other comments? I'll just say, I think uh, Councillor Jarrett has been supportive of the trust fund. Um, so I think you, you already have at least one advocate uh, and a lot of city councilors are turning over right now. So, um, you know, just think something to think about. Um, there will be new city councilors uh, pretty soon. Um, but you do have one person that I believe has been supportive of this and has been supportive of housing partnership um, and just affordable housing in general for a while. Do you know Carolyn's position on this? Um, I think the general consensus is that any city money we give, whether that's $500,000 or a million dollars, that is just the local match for the 23 other million dollars or the $18 million that's coming from the state. Um, those, those grants require a local match to show that there is local support. Um, and that if we gave $500,000 instead of $700,000 for a project, the project's still going to go forward. It's still going to get a local match. The percentage will be, you know, a decimal point lower or something like that. Um, but there is a staff burden, yes. Um, I don't believe you can use Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Fund dollars for staff time and I don't believe yeah, you, can. you can yes yes Sierra Sierra Simmons said that it built into the housing uh affordable housing trust fund is a certain amount of FTE whatever it is half an FTE Full -time whatever, equivalent. Yeah. for um yeah for um staff time so yeah. that that's good information um yeah. to know I did I I was not aware of that but um yeah there is a there is a staff component of that um, that just needs to be um, looked at if if the boss says hey this is going to happen we you know we we change our thing but um, we'll make it work Beth uh, yeah I, I think Hannah was sort of getting at this um, the my clear uh, sense of the meeting that we had with Carolyn and the mayor was they didn't see a need for additional funding. And I was kind of astonished by that, as you know, because where I come from, there's always a need for more money. Um, and it is, in fact, true that many trust funds are fueled uh, in whole or in part with CPA funding. So to the extent that we have you know, a, a structure for delivery of the CPA dollars. Um, I I almost sensed, you know, would it kind of be a tongue war um, as to who was going to administer at least the housing portion of the CPA funding. But um, I think there is a case that people have an urge to make and that we have talked about some of the elements of the case. We have, you know, a framework, but for me, at least, that case gets down to having meaningful conversations with Valley CDC and any other nonprofit or for-profit developer who has shown an interest in developing affordable housing or mixed income housing in Northampton and to be able to lay out in, you know, clear sound bites what the barriers to doing so are and to the extent that access to resources um, state or local is one of them, then we start the conversation. If it's a bunch of other stuff that we've also talked about, whether it's, you know, NIMBY or land availability or what have you, um, that's a different conversation. Um, the other thing I will, will say is uh, we didn't create the city of Northampton uh, CPA funding. We administer it. We didn't create block grant or home. Um, if there were a local mechanism for funding a trust fund 
in part at least, and we again we've talked about a transfer tax or something, um, then that makes a statement to the state that locals aren't just willing to invest money that somebody else gave them in affordable housing developments, but that locals were willing to take funds that might otherwise go elsewhere within the community um, to support housing because it matters that much. And I think that's a pretty compelling argument, but I that's the part that I'm not sure we're going to get over the goalposts with, because again, if it involves some other tax on real estate, um, you know, that's likely to be a lengthy and contentious conversation. So in any event, you know, I support the idea of moving forward on this, but I think the case is half uh, formed. Hello. <laughs> thank, thank you, Bev. Other... Sorry, I can't hear you, Carmen. Maybe it's my end. People hear me? Or... No. You're kind of frozen, so, uh, Carmen. Um, I, can you... I can hear me now. I'm frozen. All right. Somebody else has got to take over. Yeah. Can people hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. We need to do something about the internet our reception in Florence Center. Um, I wonder if it's time to um, put an invitation to the mayor and Carolyn to return to our meeting. We often used to have a meeting with the mayor once a, once a year. And um, just to talk about the yeah. Carmen, I think you're still having some internet problems. Okay, what about now? What about now? Can you hear me? Seems better, yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so what I just said that you probably didn't hear, hear was, I wonder if it's time to, talk, to ask the mayor and Carolyn to come to a housing partnership meeting to talk about this again, to talk about in the context of, for example, the Northampton Nursing Home, and just to to then make a decision you know are we going to pursue this or not or are we going to continue to have a subcommittee on this um we don't know for how long or not like so in other words i'm looking for next steps laura's doing her next steps on her on her um treadmill <laughs> so this presage is what we were, I think we're going to talk about next in our uh, update on the subcommittee that met last week. We, so we had actually talked about um, bringing the mayor back and with uh, and, and to talk about all of our um, priorities in the further okay. partnership, which includes the affordable housing trust fund, but there are other ones as well. And getting sort of pinning her down as to support on these initiatives. So <clears throat> oh, we Shall we move on to the next agenda item then, which is um, the subcommittee on the MEI uh, light um, meeting and then kind of summarize everything mm -hmm. in a few steps. All right, so let's do that. So, Gordon, do you want to say more about that subcommittee? I guess I can get us started. So that, that sort of, that's sort of the, I guess the end of the report is that we thought that's where we should we should be headed next, but there was a group of us that met last week to talk about um, follow up to um, well what what set this in motion was we we talked about possibly uh, whether we could do another sort of community meeting around issues of housing within the city, and then it led to well what what would be the purpose of that and 
reflecting back, you know, we, we, there's been a lot of these meetings over the last decade for different reports and plans that the city did. And so we were concerned about having uh, just another community meeting, which wasn't tied to necessarily a specific idea or project or proposal uh, um, or, or need. Um, so and then it came back and then, if, you know, out of that came the idea, you know, we've been talking about a lot of, we have a lot of things on our plate right now that we've been doing, working on for the last few years. And affordable housing trust, if you go back 10 years, like I think Richard and I are the ones that go back this far. We, you know, this was something that was recommended uh, in our strategic plan in 2011 and it's still sort of lumbering along. So, but we've got some new things as well. The, you know, short-term rental fees, we've got the uh, restri restriction on rental fees for tenants here in, at local ordinance, among other things, and, and transfer tax. So there's a lot of things that we could be pushing and maybe we, we need to get our politicians to sort of um, really commit to these things um, before we, and that way we know what we need to do and where we need to focus. So the idea was to sort of bring to bring the mayor back uh, and ha and sort of really put her on the spot to answer to these different ideas. Um, and so um, anyone else who was there want to add more to what summary, please do. I hope I covered it well enough, but please join me and sharing what we, we talked about. Does anybody else have anything to add? Um, so I think Gordon mentioned it, but I think there's just generally consensus that having a meeting not directly related to a project is not what we want to do. Uh, we want to have more kind of defined, if we're going to bring people together, have kind of more defined things to talk about. Some of those might come up with talking to the mayor or something else. Um, and then we did it like maybe two years ago. We did training about landlords uh, or for landlords. Um, that was another idea that was floated. Um, um, and then we did talk about, um, uh, you know, not having clear goals. So maybe some goal setting and then kind of having a silo effect, um, you know, and uh so there's, I think there's definitely some administrative things that I can work on too to have better communication. Um, um, but it didn't seem like what I thought might be um, kind of hosting these events kind of at um, other uh, venues. It There was no, there was a lot of traction on that. So I don't think we should really pursue that. It sounds like one thing we're coming to is that both for the um, MHT and the MEI, <laughs> I get my M's mixed up, that it's time to invite the mayor and possibly the mayor and Carolyn um, to a meeting. Um, I mean, we could try inviting them for November, right, Keith, and see, or- Carmen, um, yeah. Laura has her hand up, but I, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, no, but go ahead. Um, I wonder if I could just offer some comments on working with a trust. So in Amherst, they morphed from their kind of housing group, partnership-like group, into a municipal trust. Mm -hmm. um, and I can tell you a few of the things that have happened that seem like they might be advantages. Um, I also would just offer the observation, having been involved with this group for decades, that there might be enough people power in Northampton to have one good housing group. Um, and so I would be concerned if there was trying to be a parallel tr housing trust along with mm -hmm. the housing partnership, because I don't mm -hmm. see the energy for that. Um, but a housing trust can do things that a housing partnership can't. And it can do everything that a housing partnership can. So if you're going to have one or the other, I would say there's something to think about for the trust, because the trust can hold and distribute funds. And Holding and distributing funds is a very powerful tool um, in terms of um, affecting change or affecting policy. So one way that the trust, the trust in Amherst pretty much gets all its money from the CPA. They go in every year and they ask for it. And so in a lean year when the CPA doesn't have a lot of housing proposals, they still ask. 
so that they're keeping, they're building a pool of money that's dedicated to affordable housing, whether or not there happens to be a project happening that year. As you folks know, it can take years and years to, for something to be ready to come in and then they, the project might need a lot of money. We have gone in uh, kind of like now for Laurel Street when we had a gap that we needed to fill quickly. So one of the things about CPA as a developer is with it, you know twice a year funding rounds, it's pretty good, but it might not hit if you have a really pressing need. So that was the other way that the trust was set up. It would hold the CPA money, but it could take rolling applications from developers. So if you had a point in time where there's a great opportunity, it was nimble in a way that the CPA funds were not. Um, the Amherst Housing Trust has relied upon CPA and other state grants to fund their staff. And I think it's significant because when you have staff from the planning department, you are by definition sharing a person who has many other responsibilities, um, as opposed to the trust hiring its own consultant and all they're thinking about is affordable housing. Um, so that again can be, and it's no diss on Keith or Peg or anyone else, but it's just people are stretched thin. Um, and so that might be another kind of when you're looking at a list of pros and cons, like why have a trust? What can it do that the housing partnership doesn't do? Y you know, dedicating resource resources to pay for its own staff um, is significant. Um, another thing I've seen them do with their trust funds is they've done pre-development work. They've done feasibility assessment on sites, which tends to be work in Northampton that does fall to the city staff if they have time to do it. So again, and not that they're not wanting to do it and wanting to pursue it. Um, they do kind of an amazing job at it. But again, it's 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 one of many things that they're tasked with doing. Um, and in Amherst, the Municipal Trust will say, you know, we have money to pay for a survey. We have money to pay for wetlands. We have money to do these things. Because that is, a again, a super powerful tool to getting land to be available for development. So just some thoughts to throw out there. And Amherst is a great example to look at because they went from the model that you guys are using and switched over not very long ago to being a municipal trust. And do you have any idea what um, <clears throat> what percent of CPA money they ask for every year or does it vary? It varies. They go in strong and they usually get less than they ask for. Um, they usually ask for about half a million dollars and end up with two or 300,000. Um, it does not prevent developers like Valley from going direct to the CPA and asking for funds because we still do. Um, but again, it it's it gives the opportunity for the trust to have a little more control over the direction of affordable housing development in the community. Thank you, Laura. Um, Can I just ask a quick question while Laura's still? Um, yeah. Do they have funding other than CPA? A little bit, yeah. They have, you know where came from? Well, they've gotten grants. So yeah. like this municipal incentive grant, um, the mini mini grant, yep. the MBI grant, they got that. Uh, I think they might've gotten some housing choice money. Someone left the money from a sale of a property. So drips and drabs of other money um, coupled with primarily CPA funds. Um, and they, I think they're actively looking to do some kind of real estate um, transfer fee. And so if that were successful, then that money would go into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund as well. And I think that would be the plan with the contemplated transfer fees and short-term rental fees. Yeah, I think yeah. it's a long-term plan, uh, even you know, in any community to kind of build momentum to get people to do something like that. I think it's a great long-term goal. I just, you know, it's down the road. All right, thank you, Laura. Are there other questions or comments? I don't see Anna's anybody with up. a hand up. Hannah? Yeah, I just, well, first of all, Laura, thank you so much. Um, that mm -hmm. gave me personally a lot to think about. It has been, you know, something since I've been on the housing partnership, wondering like how much power we have in terms of the types of projects that we can take on and, um, I'm I'm curious if that's like a if this is a big enough consideration that it's something that we could put on like next month's agenda to talk about because I would love to get people's thoughts about like 
what it would look like in the abstract or more specific, like in a future where the housing partnership could change to be the affordable housing trust fund or have dual roles. Um, it feels like a really significant conversation. So I'm curious if people would have an interest in getting that on an agenda for a future month. Thoughts? I mean, I say sure. What what specifically though would be the agenda item? We because we talk about this almost every meeting. Um, are we looking to get better, to become better educated about what Amherst did? Or are we looking to get to the point where we're advancing this, pushing this harder with our elected officials? I guess uh, my, I mean, my takeaway from what Laura said was sort of the possibility of a future where the housing partnership kind of becomes instead a municipal affordable housing trust fund, which seems like it could be potentially a huge change. And I'm, uh, I guess it's a little bit more of an, it feels a little bit more of an abstract conversation to me than, um, uh, you know, like the level of let's get the mayor on board. So I, I'm just curious, would want to get people's thoughts about that abstract idea. Yeah, there already but, is a trust instrument, so-called trust instrument, it was created by ordinance and it already designates a structure, um, which includes, I think, I, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I think it involves three, three trustees appointed by the mayor. And I can't remember, Rich, I don't know if you remember this, but there might be a seat, one seat designated for partnership membership. So it, it contemplates a role, but it's, it's also looking for community people and bringing in, and it would want to be, the, the trustees should be people who have some experience with uh, managing trusts, um, um, not just uh, so uh, that would really help as well. But that doesn't mean it can't be amended. Um, so, I'm, but I am interested and intrigued by this notion that they morphed that the partnership morphed into the trust. I think I knew that already. I think that been, yeah. since there'd been a relationship for years with the Amherst. I think they also were the Fair Housing. Their Fair Housing Commission was also part of their charge um, as well. Yeah, they had a housing and sheltering committee. Yeah. that was active and then they wanted to set up the trust. And so those committee members basically came almost whole cloth onto the trust. Although, you know, again, over time people come and go. Um, John Hornick is the one who was instrumental in the making that change. Yeah. And I'm sure he would come and talk with you uh, if you wanted to invite him. Um, yeah. He's been I think I think, though, preceding all this is getting the mayor's read on what, how we can shape our priorities. Um, and I'm wondering, again, um, in light of the trust discussion and the MEI light discussion about inviting her, trying to invite her for November's meeting. Uh, Carmen, if, if I may, I, I think the my interaction with the mayor um is that she wants proposals I and mean, she's happy to talk big ideas and stuff like that mm -hmm. um but um i think she she likes um having kind of um um like a not a fully there's obviously room for debate and stuff like that but i think she wants uh, more fully formed mm -hmm. Um, kind of ideas, uh, okay. I think, uh, like a back and forth. How do you feel about this? Um, I think if it was more fleshed out, um, it might be a better conversation. I would like to see a copy of the trust fund enabling ordinance so that we have a real document in front of us so that we can see operationally how it works. I think getting feedback from the folks in Amherst who made it happen and to understand the political forces that might or might not be in play, but we're one leg up because we actually already have the trust. We might need to amend the number of members or how they're selected or put city council or mayoral uh, voices on there if they're worried about you know, these rogue people having the power to disperse money. But um, I, 
I think before I think Keith's point is good that before we bring this to the mayor, we need to um, take um, some more time getting a more fully formed um, concept in our what we really want to see. Okay, and so then I have a question, um, and that goes back to Laura. Laura, can you hear me? Yeah. If if we had a fully formed trust fund and the Northampton Nursing Home had come to a halt because of being denied the state funds last March, or I'm not just asking you, I'm asking everybody just to contemplate this. Would that have been a viable ask to come to a housing trust fund, the Northampton Housing Trust Fund, and say, we need this money to go forward? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I like the idea of a housing trust, but I think the answer to your question is no, because the scope of money needed for the nursing home project is so ginormous. But exactly. when we developed East Gables, which is now just leasing up uh, in Amherst, we did have a very last minute need for a little bit of extra. And we went to the state and said, can we have a little extra? And they said, go to the town. You know, we'll put in if they put in. And so we need within a few weeks to get a commitment from the town for, and we asked for $100,000. And that was money that the trust had available. So that's an example where mm -hmm. having a resource that was, sorry, just trying to stop mm -hmm. my trial. <laughs> having a resource that was quickly available allowed a project to proceed. Um, in general, we, we can't go Northampton's not going to go solo without state resources, typically, just because okay. of the magnitude of money. But, you know, there are always times when, you know, there is pre-development work or something else that has to happen mm -hmm. where you need a little bit of walking around money. Um, and so I think the, I think it's a very precious thing in my business to be able to get resources quickly, because mostly it's the opposite of that. <laughs> So even when it's not a lot of money, the ability to have resources at the ready is really significant in a world of real estate where, you know, things happen, properties pop up, opportunities come up, costs change. It, it just, it's a very dynamic uh, financial situation. Okay, thanks, Laura. It sounds like we need to talk about next, next steps. If I may, Carmen, I just want to yes. say I put my hands on the ordinance and it's um, I can just quickly tell folks just point of information. It actually calls for five, uh, a board of, of five trustees, one of whom is the mayor and then four additional two are our are, are seats are reserved for a partnership. One is for a low income, moderate income member of our community and one in the fifth seat is to be filled by someone from the business community. And it does a lot, you know, it's got a long list of powers and it's, it's it, I, you know, I bore you with all the details, but pretty much it's focused on preserving and funding affordable housing in Northampton. Mm -hmm. And home ownership opportunities is in there as well. I can, Keith, I can give, I mean, you can probably find it equally, if you need it, I can send it to you. All right. We, we don't have that much longer in our meeting. Any other comments, questions, thoughts? No? Yeah, Carmen, I, I just want to say what I think a number of people are saying, which is um, it's not clear what the me an, another meeting with the mayor um, mm -hmm. is going to accomplish until we put a finer point on the ask. Yeah. Um, so perhaps the suggestion that we really drill down on this at the next meeting is a good one. And maybe some subset of people could frame something that might be the, you know, at least discussion uh, leader for that meeting, if not a draft of what we might be saying to the mayor. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
<laughs> you seem to really want the mayor to come in next meeting. No, I, I, I totally, I totally hear what you and Keith are saying. Yeah. I guess to go back to what you just said, um, we'll put these things on the agenda again. Um, but then my question comes back to what, what could be the next steps in our discussion to further that discussion? And I'm not, I am not sure. I'm well, not sure. Maybe, it's, maybe it's to draft a piece that, uh, um, in a succinct way, articulates our latest thinking about why reinvigorate the Affordable Housing Trust and how it will, you know, work within and leverage um, the other things that are going on to support affordable housing. Um, and, you know, certainly I'm very compelled by Laura's suggestions that we focus on flexibility. I, I have heard that um, the CPC could be more flexible as an organization, uh, that they're not limited to two meetings a year. Um, uh, but uh, I don't, you know, know that, again, people see that except if you're a developer is a big impediment. Um, but in any event, uh, the flexible ability to respond solely to affordable housing issues to me is in and of itself a very compelling uh, point. I think Laura's got another thought for us. Laura? I would be looking at drafting a list of pros and cons, like really side by side, What what is the partnership do? What does the trust do? Where are the pros and cons? And I think the fact that you have an established trust doesn't, I mean, you can amend it, right? I I, I wouldn't, I don't think you want a, a municipal trust of five people. That's too few. <laughs> so I, I think just because it says that now, I mean, that could be something that you're bringing to the city to say, we want to revive it. We want it to stand in for what we have now. We don't want to make more work for the city. Um, and we want to amend this trust document in the following A, B, C, D, E, F, G ways so that it really is tailored to here and now. The, the argument to the city about being able to staff your own activities is going to be very appealing. Right, Keith? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know both uh, on a on a resource side as well as just a capacity side i mean that the staff are really scrambling northampton is a very has a wonderful amazing planning department and they try to do a lot and if you don't come in saying you know we're going to take away some work we're going to add work here but take away work mm -hmm. here or we're going to add work but here's how we're going to pay for it it's it's going to be a tough sell. Thanks for that. We haven't focused on that angle before. It's huge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I appreciate it. Mm. Yeah. But I would add it's huge if you have the resources to pay for it. <laughs> and so it becomes circular, right? Um, if a significant amount of the CPA funding isn't going to come into the trust, then we have to be identifying other sources of money. <clears throat> It, we talked about this and I probably even volunteered to play with it a little bit. I think we should model what we think a successful trust could look like over time uh, in terms of just what Laura's talking about, the capacity to um, move quickly, the capacity to do uh, things that perhaps the CPC can't or chooses not to, uh, the capacity to get to a point where it has its own staffing and isn't reliant on the city. Um, and maybe it's a five-year scheme uh, to get to a place where the resources are significant and the staffing is in place. So I'd like to make a suggestion that the subcommittee that was working on the housing trust fund, um, I don't remember exactly who that was, Hannah, Edgar, Gwen, Bev, were you on that subcommittee? Well, I was supposed to be, and then... Uh... And then we kind of stop meeting or whatever, okay. but yes. Okay, how about this? That we have a subcommittee, slightly different. I will join that. 
Deb, I hope you can join that. Hannah, um, I don't know if anybody else would like to, and that we meet once between now and November and try to start hammering out some of these points that both Laura, you and Bev, and you, Hannah, have been making tonight. Carmen, I can take on sending out like a doodle poll for scheduling for that. And I vote in person. I cannot concentrate when I'm looking at Zoom. <laughs> Are people up for that for in person? Yeah. Okay. I will send out a poll then for meeting. Okay. And you're going to send it out to the people that I just mentioned? Yeah. Should I send it out to just that group or send it out to everybody in case other people have the time and want to join? Is that is that something I can do? Send it out to the whole list or just? I mean... As long as we have a dedicated group, which we're saying is you, Bev, me, I don't know where Edgar stands at this point. Um, I mean, I'd love to have, Gordon, I'd love to have you or Richard on it. I don't know if you can do that, especially if it's in person. I know you can't. Um, Why don't you just send it and make it clear that this, this is something we discussed because there's a few of us not here tonight and they may be interested in joining when great. they see that. And then you okay. can just self-select by answering the poll. All okay, right, that's what I'll do. Thank you, Hannah, for doing that. Appreciate it. All right, so we have a plan. Let's move on. Anything else that has not been on the agenda for a brief announcement or a very brief discussion? I have a quick question um, about uh, the public comment. Was the term member that she used, was that referring to board member, not members of the community? Does anybody know? What was the context, Richard? Do you know, remember? She was talking about some members' comments. Yes, I think, yes I think it was members of the partnership uh, that she read in last month's minutes. And we had asked Edgar for an update on, on Northampton Housing Authority board. And he was sort of talking about some of the dynamic difficulties there, I think. And so, Carol, that's Lee what Brown, I assumed. I just wanted yeah. to know it was okay. Yes, thank it you. It was a little unclear. Yeah, it was a little unclear. Yeah. And I think she might have been trying to be politic, but who knows? Yeah. All right. So, let us close the meeting. Um, so handle like you'll send out the doodle poll. That's the next step. And we'll meet um, between now and November 7th or whenever that meeting is. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved. A second. I'll second. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>